Thank you, may be seated. Someday we may find Christians surviving respiratory viruses because of all the singing they did and built up their respiratory system. Praise that God makes you stronger. Yes. <clears throat> we are in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 in verse 17. Paul always begins new sections in Corinthians with the word now. So we're talking about another issue with the Corinthian church. Uh, we can be thankful for others providing us uh, uh, circumstances wherein we could receive instruction. Instead of looking down on the Corinthians, we ought to thank God that there were challenges in the church because we are just like them in so many ways in our, our society and we are able to glean from the correction that the apostles gave them and save ourselves from the same pitfalls where we would have fallen had, uh, had uh, we not had that instruction. We're talking this morning about Holy Communion, the Lord's Supper, which are the same thing. Uh, I know that there's some groups like the German Baptists who separate them into two different the Holy Communion and the Lord's Supper, to them are two different things. There's no basis for that in the Scripture. Uh, this was meant to be a gift. Holy Communion was given to us as a gift of God. It was given to us as an encouragement to remember His death till He come. To remember His grace. To remember His love. To remember His mercy. To remember the sacrifice. And it's our fault if it becomes our damnation and condemnation because we are partaking unworthily. Keep that in mind. It was intended as a gift. It was given to us not as a trap. It was not given to us for something to stumble over. That is our stupid fault if it happens. Okay? So, verse 17. Now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not, that you come together, you assemble, not for the better, but for the worse. The assembly was meant as a gift for our betterment. Communion and the assembly, the two things we're talking about, were meant to be a blessing, to help us endure to the end, to encourage us and comfort us. If we come together and it's to our own uh, condemnation and not our betterment, shame on us. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> so, understand we're talking about when they come together, when the church assembles. This is not once every six months, not once a year, not once a month. This is weekly when they assemble. We're talking about what they do when they assemble, okay? For first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be div divisions among you. Was that not okay? Some people teach that it's okay. That we ought to have diversity. Uh, and so forth and you know that's what grace is all about letting every man do that which is right in his own eyes sorry Paul did not think it was okay that when they came together there were divisions among them he said and I partly believe it well naturally with the attitude they had setting themselves up criticizing apostles yeah he, he, it's like that's no surprise to me but it's not okay it's not okay for there must be also heresies among you. Now, a heresy is, is an entrenched division. There can be some differences of opinion. There's different levels of maturity, different levels of understanding, okay? We're all growing into the unity of the faith. But a heresy is an entrenched difference of opinion based on foundational beliefs. It is, it is more than just a differing opinion. It is one that people have uh, become entrenched in. Uh, there must be also heresies among you that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. What does that mean? That means that these entrenched, when, when differences become entrenched, it causes controversy, and that controversy highlights differences of foundational thought, and those who are right will be then, uh, the, as the sides polarize, and separate, then those who are truly on the right foundation will become more and more evident. So we can have, here's the way it works. You have a lot of people here who seem to be somewhat in agreement. 
When there comes up a controversy, it causes them to all take sides. It causes them to polarize, and then we know who's who. It, it re really reveals who's who at that time. And Paul says, this is a necessary thing. God allows it. In fact, God also, He allows it to the point that He would allow a false prophet to have miraculous abilities in order to test His people. We, uh, Jesse spoke of that this morning in Sunday school. Deuteronomy 13.1 If there arise you a, a, among you, arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and giveth thee a sign or a wonder. And the sign or the wonder come to pass. Whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods, which thou hast not known. In other words, contrary to the scriptures. And let us serve them. The only thing that makes it another god is because it's contrary to the revelation of Jehovah. Okay? Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord Jehovah your Elohim proveth you to know whether ye love Jehovah or Yahweh. When I use those two terms, Yahweh and Jehovah come from the same uh, consonants in the Hebrew. It's just different vowels in between. Okay? So the J and the Y, uh, Jesus, Yeshua, became in the, in the Latin Isus, okay, and then the, that became Jesus, but the J and the Y have to do with pronounce, trying to pronounce a Hebrew uh, letter in English. So Yeshua, uh, Jesus, Jesus, uh, Jehovah, Jehovah, Yahweh, these, these are all the same, they just have different vowel points and different people, some people say, well, the YHVH uh, should be Jehovah. Some people say Yahweh. But understand it's all the same. And I personally don't know who's right on the subject. I think Yahweh may be closer than Jehovah. But uh, nonetheless, I just want to make a quick explanation there. That's for free off the subject. Um, <clears throat> Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that person because the Lord, Yahweh your Elohim, is testing you to see if you love the Lord with your God with all your heart and with all your soul. What does that mean? God's ways are not some arbitrary things that this God happened to choose. God's ways are a principle of unselfish love, holiness, righteousness, justice. He's the just one. God's ways are foundationally different than any other ways. And if you love the foundational principles of God's holiness, His justice, His fairness, His impartiality, His unselfish love, and all that that means, that's God. When you love righteousness, you love that God. When you love righteousness, you love that God's law. And every other God, every other option, is, a, is because you don't love the law and the principles of this God. God knows it. So it's not a matter of, well, you know, I believe this is the right way to go because after all, they got this prophet, what he said came to pass. What he said came to pass. Okay. The devil can do that. Right there, it proves it. God allows it. Right there, it proves it. But where is that law taking you? What is the law of this God? What are the principles of this God? If they're not the same as Jehovah, What's different and why? And why do you want this over this? God is watching. He's taking notes. Okay? God is not on trial. We are. Right. Okay? He doesn't feel on trial. Well, I wish, you know, God needs to prove himself. God says, sorry, I'm not on trial. You are. Luke 2.34 and Simeon blessed him and said unto Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yea, a sword shall pierce through thine own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Jesus was not on trial. Jerusalem was. Israel was. The world was. God, God is not concerned about the jurisdiction of your court. He's not concerned about your conclusions as far as judging him. He's watching you. He's the judge. He's the just one. He's the owner of the planet. All right? 
And so, Acts 20, 30. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. This is what Paul says, that there are divisions, that they which are approved may be made manifest. The disciples they draw away, why were they drawn away? There's reasons why people are drawn away. There's reasons why people follow error instead of truth. It's because of things in their heart that are being revealed. Okay? 1 Timothy 4.1 Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. Why? Because it wasn't adequate? No. Giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Why would they give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils? There was something in there they liked. There was something in there they wanted. There was something in there they loved more than God's justice and righteousness. That's why. And God allows it. Because God knows if you're drawn away by that, you need to go. Mm -hmm. God's not on trial. So, the conflict, Paul says, this conflict is going to polarize the church so that those who are truly loving God and truly loving righteousness will be manifested. And that's okay with God. Okay. So, we're talking about the church coming together. When the church assembles. Verse 20. When you come together, therefore, into one place. When, how often do they do that? Weekly. When you assemble in one place, this is not eating the Lord's Supper. This is not eat the Lord's Supper. What he's saying is, this is not it, guys. This that you are doing is not what the Lord's Supper was intended to be. This, they came together to break bread. They came together to remember the Lord. And the, the other things they did were centered around that. Okay? And so he says, when you assemble into one place, you're not, you're not properly observing the Lord's Supper. This proves that they did it every time they assembled. Weekly. When they, when they, he, the Corinthian church was told to take up their collection on the first day of the week when they assembled. Here, he's talking about when you come together. When you assemble, you're coming together not for the better, but for the worse. And he's talking directly about their use of communion. Turn to Acts 20, verse 7. <clears throat> and upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them. Now, there's, there's a lot of people who fight for their Sabbatarianism, and they'll say, well, that just happened to be when Paul was there. It just happened to be when he got there, they wanted to have a meeting. Look at verse 6. And we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and came unto them to Troas in five days, where we abode seven days. He left on a Monday. He got there probably on Tuesday. Okay? It was a Tuesday to Monday situation. Uh, or Monday to Monday, <coughs> depending on how he used the terms. So why is he preaching to them? Why, why, if he was there seven days, and upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread? That proves he's been there for six days. But this is the day they came together. This is the day he preached unto them. So verse 7 gains a lot of strength yeah. by the ending of verse 6. Right. <laughs> okay? Anybody can see that that's willing to see it? Okay. Uh, the triumphal entry, the day Jesus rose, the day he later met, later met with the disciples, Pentecost, the Lord's Supper, and the taking up of the offerings, all clearly said to be on what we call Sunday, the first day of the week. So, this church is meeting every Lord's Day, and they're taking communion every time they make this assembly. All right? Verse 21. For an eating... Everyone taketh before his own supper, and one is hungry, and another is drunken. What? Have ye not houses to eat and drink in? Or despise ye the church of God, and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. Evidently, they were making the Lord's Supper into a feast unto the Lord, where the rich brought their own food and ate of their bounty, while the poor class ate their small amount. They weren't coming together for what we used to call in the Baptist church a potluck, where everybody brought a dish and all ate of everybody's dishes, okay? It wasn't a common meal. Evidently, the rich were coming in with their food and sitting 
and eating their meal, and the others were coming in with their food and eating their meal, and somehow this was a feast to the Lord, which is not what communion was meant to be in the first place. But it's how the heathen did it, and we find the church at Corinth, uh, a lot of people trying to incorporate baggage from their past instead of following the instructions. Um, the word drunken here does not mean intoxicated. Otherwise, you have Paul saying, don't you have houses to eat and get intoxicated in? That's foolishness. Okay? It means filled to the full, as Adam Clark clearly says. Um, he says, the teachers which had crept into the Corinthian church appear to have perverted the whole of this divine institution, for the celebration of the Lord's Supper appears to have been made among them a part of an ordinary meal. The people came together, and it appears, brought their provisions with them. Some had much, others had less, some ate to excess, others had scarcely enough to suffice nature. One was hungry, and the other was drunken, which is a Greek word, means filled to the full. This is the sense of the word in many places in Scripture. Barnes says, There is no evidence in the passage before us, nor is any adduced from any other part of the New Testament, that the observance of the Lord's Supper was preceded in the time of the apostles by such a festival as a love feast, contrary to uh, a lot of people's opinion. <clears throat> he says, To my mind, it seems altogether improbable that the disorders in Corinth would assume this form, that they would first observe a common feast and then the Lord's Supper in the regular manner. The statement before us leads to the belief that all was irregular and improper, that they had entirely mistaken the nature of the ordinance and had converted it into an occasion of ordinary festivity. They had not only erred, therefore, by misunderstanding altogether the nature of the Lord's Supper and by supposing that it was a common festival like those which they had been accustomed to celebrate, but they had also entirely departed from the idea that it was a festival to be taken in a common, in, in common and at a common table. It had become a scene where every man ate by himself and where the very idea that there was anything like a common celebration or a celebration together was abandoned. So, I agree with what he observes there. Uh, it wasn't that they came together, had the Lord's Supper, had a feast, and then had the Lord's Supper. I didn't, it, the, the Lord's Supper wasn't meant to be a meal that was meant to, uh, to satisfy hunger. And then he goes on to say this, verse 23. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. <coughs> that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, the word there is Eucharisteo, and a lot of people talk about celebrating the Eucharist. Uh, we think, well, that's, that's Catholic. No, that's just, that's the Greek word for Thanksgiving. That, that's okay to use that for the word, for, instead of communion or Lord's Supper, to call it the Eucharist. It's fine, even though uh, maybe our background didn't do it that way. He had given thanks, he broke it, and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup, when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. That was the simple basics of the ordinance. No other meal, no nothing else required. Uh, <clears throat> this is what Paul delivered. Okay, um, at the Passover meal, where the Lord's Supper was instituted, there was a meal, but even then it was, it was not just a big feast. It was a very special Seder Supper, uh, ceremonially given with certain steps and so forth. But Jesus, that, that was once a year. Obviously the church remembered the Lord every time they assembled. Okay, and so it was not to be a Seder Supper every time. It was... It was what Paul delivered them right here. The basics. Now at the Passover meal, each man had a cup, and it was refilled four times. The four cups represent the four expressions of deliverance promised by God in Ex Exodus 6, 6 through 7. I will bring out, I will deliver, I will redeem, and I will take. Each cup is imbibed at a specific point in the Seder Supper, almost like what we would call a toast. Let's, you know, drink to the health of the nation or whatever. Uh, people who are drinking alcoholic beverages call it a toast. But in the Seder Supper, uh, they had four cups that they would drink at specific points. Uh, and the first one was for Kiddush, a, a recital of a blessing. The second was for what they said, Megid, which was retelling the Passover story. The third for Birkat Hamazan, 
uh, which was grace after meals. And the fourth for the Hallel, which is a recital of Psalms 113 to 118. But none of that needs to be brought into communion in the Lord's Supper. Paul gave us the basics, okay? The question would arise, which, which is the cup of blessing that Paul speaks of where Jesus instituted communion? Well, if you, if you look at Luke, uh, Luke 22, 15, the question is, what is the third cup or what is the fourth cup? And I don't think it matters, uh, really, because the basic is taking bread broken, solemnly broken, to remember his body, a cup solemnly drank to remember the blood of the New Testament. However, in Luke, it's interesting because Luke gives us, it records two cups. And they were both divided the same. And that's good to remember because the way Jesus divided his cup with the other disciples was the same as they divided all the cups in the Seder Supper. There wasn't a difference. Verse uh, 15, And he said unto them, With desire I had desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, uh, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took the bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise, also the cup after supper, probably the fourth cup, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you. So in Luke it records two cups and they divided among themselves. Well, okay. <clears throat> It doesn't mean they all went around and sipped the same cup. That would not be the standard in a Passover meal. It would mean more likely that this word cup, uh, which could also mean pitcher, okay, uh, it simply means drinking vessel, all right? And um, that he either took a, a drinking vessel, poured some in his cup, and passed it around. They all divided it into their cups, which would have been really the proper way to follow the Passover meal, um, because they all have, they all would have a cup in the Passover meal. Now, I suppose that if they didn't have four cups, uh, which I don't think that Jesus would have had a shortage of cups, they could have shared a cup. It, that, there's no indication of that, uh, and no reason for that. So, Paul gives the Corinthian church, the vital and necessary ingredients. Number one, unleavened bread, solemnly broken and eaten in commemoration of Christ's body. Number two, a cup of grape juice or wine to commemorate his shed blood to ratify the new covenant. No doubt the wine used by Jesus was most likely a product of fermentation, but it was also kosher or rabbinically correct and clean by the fact that it was cut with at least three parts of water. Otherwise, they would have been uh, considered unclean. And therefore, uh, what Jesus drank there was not uh, full-strength wine, though it was probably uh, not new wine, because the new wine didn't come till summer. We're, in, we're at the 15th of Nisan, okay? Where would they have new wine at that time? Uh, most likely they didn't. They didn't have freezers like we do. But whenever they would drink wine in the... In the uh, law-abiding Jew, they would cut it at least three parts with water, sometimes more, which would make it basically uh, very, the, the, the effect of intoxication would be very low at that point. Okay, now there are people who, who may, would very highly criticize the way we take communion, and they're called one-cuppers. Okay, they believe that everyone should drink from the same cup, because they imagine that this is what Jesus did with his disciples. However, none of us drink from the Lord's cup, but our own cups in remembrance of his cup and his blood. One cuppers always actually have two cups, one for the women and one for the men. Okay? They have everyone line up down the aisle, and one holds the cup and wipes the rim after each person drinks. Do they believe that this is what Jesus did with the disciples? Absolutely not. But they believe it is the best way to facilitate their one cup dogma. It's the best way that they can 
accomplish and facilitate their one cup dogma, but they know that that's, Jesus didn't have the disciples line up and come by and wipe the rim every time they drank. They, don't, they wouldn't even say that. But yet they turn around and be, would be critical of us all having separate cups. That's a bunch of foolishness. All it is is a, a partisan spirit fighting for their own personal ism and not taking into reality uh, the fact that they don't even, they, they're not even one cuppers. Okay? And they're not actually doing what Jesus... If people who want to get overly technical should be in an upper room with at least 13 men and nobody else, one traitor among them, <laughs> reclining around a table, having a Seder supper. Okay? Jesus never meant for us to follow the exact technical details. Paul gave us the necessary ingredients, and that's the important thing. Um, the Roman Catholic priests take the wafer and place it in each person's mouth or hand, and usually the people in the Catholic Church don't get the wine. It's kind of a somewhat of a, a, a joke that, that, that you get the wafer and the priest saves the wine for himself. And sadly, that's, that's, there's more truth than fiction there. Um, in the Catholic website, I'm going to read you the instructions of how to receive a wafer on your tongue. They all line up. And this is from a, a priest. Then with head straight or tilted slightly back, open your mouth wide and extend your tongue. The tongue need not protrude far out of the mouth, but it should block the view of the lower lip. The minister will place the sacred host on your tongue. Two things are very important here. Open wide and extend the tongue. I have noticed that many people only slightly open the mouth and others do not extend the tongue. Others do both. It is difficult and sometimes impossible for the minister to safely place the host on the tongue under these circumstances. Wait until the sacred host is safely placed on the tongue and only then return your tongue and close your mouth. It is not proper to use your teeth to receive and it is never a good idea to bite the minister's fingers. So wait until the sacred host is safely on your tongue before moving. <clears throat> and this is their reasoning as to why uh, they give the bread and usually not the wine. <clears throat> In Roman Catholicism, we believe that the real presence of Christ is fully contained in both the bread and the wine, Christ's body and blood. We can receive Christ completely just by taking the bread. And so it is optional to also bless the wine. I think that also means a church could presumably just bless the wine and not have any bread. I believe bread is favored for practical reasons. Spilled wine is much harder to clean up than dropped wafers. This is especially important after they have become Jesus' body and blood. It is a great insult to walk on any part of Jesus that has fallen on the ground. Due to a lack of extraordinary ministers, my parish chooses not to bless the wine during regular Masses. Only special Masses, such as Christmas, Easter, and the upcoming Holy Week Masses, have wine. In addition, parishioners can choose not to take Jesus' blood for their own personal reasons. Some parishioners don't take it to avoid germs from spreading. What about the priest putting it on? Anyways, I personally don't drink any alcohol whatsoever, so I pass by the wine whenever it is offered. Even after it has become Christ's blood, it still retains its original property of containing alcohol. Nonsense. Yes. High-tech, you know, elite, elitist nonsense. Okay, let's go on. Verse 26. For as often as you eat this bread, not as seldom, but as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup. This bread, this cup. Okay? Not the one that Paul had, but the ones that we have. Our cup, our bread, but in remembrance of that cup and that bread. Okay? In remembrance of what it, it, it uh, uh, represented. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till He come. And that's the basics of it. Verse 27, wherefore, <coughs> okay, because of this, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Wherefore, to remember this death unworthily is to trample on the world's most sacred event. And surely nothing would provoke the wrath of God more. 
it's important that we establish the difference between unworthily and unworthy. Albert Barnes has a good note on that. He says, perhaps there is no expression in the Bible that has given more trouble to weak and feeble Christians than this. It is certain that there is no one that has operated to deter so many from the communion, or that it is so often made use of as an excuse for not making a profession of religion. The excuse is, quote, I am unworthy to partake of this holy ordinance. I shall only expose myself to condemnation. I must therefore wait until I become more worthy and better prepared to celebrate it. End quote. It is important, therefore, that there should be a correct understanding of this passage. Most persons interpret as if it were unworthy, not unworthily, and seem to suppose that it refers to their personal qualifications, to their unfitness to partake of it, rather than to the manner in which it is done. It is to be remembered, therefore, that the word here used is an adverb and not an adjective, and has reference to the manner of observing the ordinance and not to their personal qualifications or fitness. It is true that in ourselves we are all unworthy of an approach to the table of the Lord, unworthy to be regarded as His followers, unworthy of a title of everlasting life. But it does not follow that we may not partake of this ordinance in a worthy, in effect, a proper manner. With a deep sense of our sinfulness, our need of a Savior, and with some just views of the Lord Jesus as our Redeemer. Whatever may be our consciousness of personal unworthiness and unfitness, and that consciousness uh, cannot be too deep. Yet we may have such love to Christ, and such a desire to be saved by Him, and such a sense of, worth, of His worthiness, as to make it proper for us to approach and partake of this ordinance. The term unworthily means improperly, in an unworthy or improper manner in a manner unsuitable to the purpose for which it was designed or instituted. And that's why verse 28 says, But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat. It doesn't say, so let him refrain. It doesn't say, so let him not eat. Okay? Just get right with God. Amen? Amen. Let a man examine himself, and so <coughs> let him eat of that bread, and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh without getting right with God, unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Okay, what if we were talking about the funeral of your beloved son murdered by his enemies, and you saw a commemoration of that funeral, and you saw someone partaking in an unworthily, in an improper manner? Would that invoke the wrath of a father or mother whose beloved son died at the hands of his murderers, of his enemies? And yet, you are partaking thereof without proper reverence, without due respect and due worship, without having uh, cited that Jesus was a prophet. While you're not living according to his word, yet you're remembering his death, that's what his enemies do. Okay? Examine yourself, whether you be in the faith. If you're not honoring the Lord Jesus Christ, if you're not loving Him, if you're not on His team, if you're not holy, holding His banner, but yet you are remembering His death, what does that say? What does that communicate to God? So it says here, He that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. He is guilty. Okay, uh, to eat and drink in the remembrance of Christ's blood and sacrifice makes you guilty. <clears throat> um, eating and drinking damnation, the word is prima. It means judgment, condemnation, damnation. Now, it brings corporate dis disfavor. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. There is corporate disfavor when the church is not properly being careful about communion in their weekly service, okay? That means not just letting anybody and everybody come in and partake. That means upholding church discipline. That means giving proper instruction and warning the participants. Because you can ignorantly tread on the holiness of God like... Uh, like Uzziah did, or Usa, I'm sorry, Usa did, 
You can ignorantly tread on God's holiness like Usa and still die. Okay? Or you can knowingly tread on God's holiness like Ananias and Sapphira did and die, or like Uzziah did. In any case, you're not discerning the Lord's body. You're not really on His team, and He knows it. And so to remember the death of His Son to buy your redemption, while you aren't lining up with Him 100%, while you don't love Him with all your heart, that doesn't sit well with God. For if we would judge ourselves, verse 31, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord. Why? That we should not be condemned with the world. So when you eat and drink damnation to yourself, it means you're going to be condemned with the world. So that means that uh, God's chastening is for the purpose of trying to save you in spite of your insult. In spite of the fact that you are insulting His Son, you're insulting Him by partaking of communion unworthily, He's still trying to save your wretched hive. If we resist His chastening hand, you can go read Hebrews 5, uh, Hebrews 12, 5-29, through 29, to see what happens when you resist the chastening of the Lord. God will chasten to try and keep us from being condemned with the world. But that alone does not keep you from being condemned with the world. Your response to chastening will keep you from being condemned with the world. Amen? Amen. Okay, verse 33. Wherefore, my beloved, my, my brethren, when you come together to eat, tarry the word tarry means to wait, and I think it means more than just to wait. They that wait upon the Lord. There's a number of times when the word wait means more than just to wait. It means to consider one another. It means to wait upon one another uh, as uh, though we care for one another. Okay? Be considerate of one another. <coughs> and so tarry one for another. Don't, don't come together. And just do your own thing without considering what's going on in the whole. Wait for one another. Observe the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Communion together. He said, if any man hunger, let him eat at home. This is not meant to be a meal for that purpose. Okay? It's not a feast to the Lord. This is a solemn remembrance of His broken body and shed blood. This bread and this cup. And there need not be anything else involved. All right? And he says here, that you come not together under condemnation. What a sad thing. God has given us the church assembly. We're to come together. We're to come together for our salvation. To build one another up. To edify one another. To provoke one another to love and good works. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. This was to be God's part of His protocol so that I as a believer would overcome. Think about how hard it would be to grow spiritually and be educated in the scriptures if there never was a Sunday service. We have been alone as a family. It is difficult to be alone. Sunday morning, it's hard to make Sunday morning something special. Everybody get up, dress up. You know, it's so easy to just, well, let's have some Bible time. And it, it kind of, it's not quite the same. And any family that's been alone and tried to keep the Lord's Day special knows what I'm talking about. It is a beautiful thing to be able to get up and go to church and meet with believers and to sing the hymns and have a sermon and a Sunday school lesson and meditate in the Word of God and fellowship. Jesus knew we needed it. He prepared it for that very reason. God ordained it for that very purpose. The same as the synagogue and the temple and everything else He gave His people. So, for us to have this and it to actually work against us, actually work for our damnation. Pitiful. For you to sit and hear sermon after sermon after sermon, only to harden your heart. Shame on you. You're treasuring up wrath against the day of wrath of the righteous judgment of God. Think about it. God is not fooled. He's not stupid. He knows exactly who you are. He knows exactly what you're doing. 
He knows your thoughts. He knows what you do in private. He knows what you think. <clears throat> that you come not together unto condemnation. And the rest will I set in order when I come. Paul did visit and set things in order. He left Ephesus, traveled through Macedonia, and then spent the three months of winter at Corinth after writing this letter. <clears throat> um, Adam Clark says, Let him not come to the house of God to eat an ordinary meal. Let him eat at home, take that in his own house, which is necessary for the support of his body, before he comes to the sacred repast, where he should have the feeding of his soul alone in view. Now, that doesn't mean that after services we can't have a meal together. But the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Supper, the communion, is something that is for baptized believers only. So if we're going to come together for a common meal, what about the children? What about visitors? If the Lord's Supper is taken as a common meal, are we going to tell the visitors you have to sit and watch us eat? Okay, think about it. No. That wasn't, that wasn't what communion was. Communion was to be a sacred remembrance among church members in good standing of like faith and practice. Okay? In our website it says this. We take communion weekly and only allow believers of like faith and practice to partake. We keep the communion clean as Christ commanded. We would wait until we've had opportunity to meet with you and know that you are a believer of like faith and practice and a member in good standing of a church of like faith and practice before we would just invite you to partake. This is a matter of reverent stewardship concerning our proper discerning of the body of Christ and nothing personal against you. If you visit, please do not be offended or think we look down on you if, as a visitor, you are not automatically invited to partake. We are accountable before God to allow to follow carefully the scriptural teaching on this subject. We would be glad to take the scriptures and explain our position to you. If a person gets offended because the church is striving to rightly discern the body of Christ and so doesn't immediately accept them into communion, they prove thereby that they don't see it as important as it is right. and they prove that they're not fit for for a worthily partaking of communion. Okay? They don't under, they obviously don't get it. <clears throat> if you understand the sacredness and importance of rightly discerning the body, then you will be trying to find a faith of like faith and practice or trying to move here or if you are not in a biblical church and you're not striving to be in a biblical church, you don't understand communion and the importance of it anyways. Okay? So, <clears throat> if you understand that every believer is expected to be in a local assembly, rightly dividing the Word of God, rightly dividing and discerning the body of Christ, in communion with local believers, following the Scriptures, meeting the terms of the New Covenant, if you don't see that important, then you're not even of one like mind with us. The reason we're doing what we're doing the reason we give our tithes and offerings, the reason we come together, the reason we put up with one another, the reason we love one another in spite of, you know, slight differences, the reason for all that is because we have instructions that we cherish and embrace from our Lord. Okay? We believe that He knows best. And knowing best means us coming together, uh, observing the faith once delivered to the saints, according to the Scripture, weekly taking communion, and we believe that if we are faithful in that, there's a blessing. It's for our benefit. We're not adding anything to God. This is for us. Communion's for us. The preaching is for us. The church body's for us. The church discipline, the accountability is for us. <clears throat> so, if we have our hearts right with God, it will be a gift. It will be a blessing. It'll be to our salvation. If we are so carnal that it's not a blessing and a gift and to our salvation, if it's to our condemnation, that is 100% our fault right. and not God's. And therefore, communion should not be a burden. It should be a blessing. Accountability should not be a burden. It should be a blessing. We should come together and love 
to give to the Lord our offerings. We should love to come together and sing His praises together. If any of it becomes a burden, it's a really high priority flashing light, a beacon that you've got real problems inside in your heart. Because it's meant to be a blessing. Let's stand together. <clears throat> any questions or comments? I hope we've covered the basis on communion. It's a very important issue in the church. Very sacred. It is, it is uh, in the early church, they came together to break bread. They didn't come together to sing, though they did sing. They didn't come together to hear preaching, though they did hear preaching. They didn't come together to fellowship, though they did fellowship. They came together to remember the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus. And the preaching and the singing is more designed to make it done worthily. To get us in shape. To illuminate us. To help us to be right with God. So when we partake of these holy elements in remembrance of His body and blood. This is not a sac. The Catholic Church sees this as a sacrament. You are actually partaking Jesus' body and blood. And Jesus, you know, where Jesus said, If you eat my body and drink my blood... That's your salvation. They take that literal instead of spiritually and figurative the way Jesus said it. Okay? Um, when I partake of this, I'm partaking of Jesus Christ, His body and His blood. That's what He was talking about. When I partake of the truth and the life. The way, the truth, and the life. Okay? But when we partake, we're partaking of unleavened bread and grape juice for the sake of remembering. Hopefully, with the utmost gratitude. Hopefully with the utmost humility that this is what it took to save a wretched soul like me. Hopefully with a I love you God. Thank you in our hearts. Any thoughts? Just thinking as we judge ourselves it's important what criteria we use. Amen. That are discerned and properly educated. Otherwise we come away feeling good when we ought not. And that's a good point. Paul told them let a man examine himself. But if, if any man fails to examine himself, Paul was at this point examining them. Okay? Yes, you should examine yourself. That keeps the ministers from having to examine you. It doesn't mean you are exempt from the ministers examining you. Okay? It just means that keeps you from them having to examine you. Any other thoughts? Let's pray.